Most of you will know about a Swiss missionary who tried to know everything there was to know about a people whom he called the Tonga tribe. Today we refer to them as Batsonga Machangan. Such was the passion of Henry Alexander Juno to know every secret thing about the Batonga Batsonga so that at times he sounded like a voyeur. So what he did could sometimes be described as voyeurism of sorts. It is said, for example, that while he was working at Silubane as a missionary, he volunteered to join the young men who were going to circumcision school, willing to undergo everything they were going to undergo but for him, it was part of his research. Unfortunately for him, Chief Mshlava and those who counseled him objected. And Juno never made it to circumcision school. Instead, he attached himself to a local Sangoma by the name of Mankelu, from whom he learned as much as possible as well as several dozen articles in the South African Journal of Science, Juno wrote two volumes, very well known, titled The Life of a South African Tribe, volumes which were so good that they continue to be read and to be plagiarized even today. At the beginning of his first volume, Juno describes how a Tsonga child was born. Now, I thought this could give us an idea of how Professor Nkondo might have been born. So I'm going to quote from Juno a passage that describes this phenomenon. Here we go. When a new member of the tribe is expected, when the mother begins to feel the pangs of childbirth, ekulumiwa, the father sends word to the midwives of the neighborhood and all of them come at once. They are called Tinsungukati. The place chosen for the delivery, Puluka, is generally the back of the hut Emma Hosi where the pregnant woman lives temporarily. Some mats are brought and hung up in such a way as to form a small enclosure. This is done to protect the woman from indirect onlookers. Should there be enough bush to hide her, the mats are not used. A big wooden mortar is given to her to lean against during her pains. The whole place is called by a special term, Mfukweni or Ewusaken. The baby may be born without any help, but as a rule, the midwives consider it their duty to submit the patient to a long and painful manipulation, to regular kneading performed with their hands, sometimes with their feet. Now, sometimes they succeed in their feet. End of quote. Clearly then, on the 28th of August 1940, the midwives of Mahebe, the village where Professor Nkondo was born, succeeded in their feat. What a glorious day it must have been for the Nkondo family when they welcomed another son into the family fold. When it comes to reasons as to why I stand constantly and forever in awe of Professor Nkondo, 
I am spoiled for choice. As a would-be scholar myself, I revere him as a scholar of note, one who has risen from the nondescript banks of the Mahebe River in Limpopo to making the whole world his home, drinking from its various fountains of knowledge. Professor Nkondo is the epitome of a global citizen. His ability to cause the English language to obey him often leaves me dizzy with admiration. Sometimes when I read or hear him speak eloquently on policy and policy analysis, my intellectual juices flow and I just can't have enough. He belongs to that galaxy of intellectual stars from Limpopo who have been my inspiration ever since I was a young boy walking barefoot in the dusty streets of Middleland Soweto and in the uneven footpaths of Valdesia in Limpopo. For all the socio-economic difficulties of my childhood, for all the draconian living conditions in which I grew up, in a country that did not belong to me any more than I felt I belonged to it, one thing, one thing that I never lacked were tangible, real flesh role models like Professor Mushen Kond. It is inspiring enough to admire a celebrity one has never met. But to have the opportunity of personal proximity and dialogical engagement with someone as erudite as Professor Nkondo is a privilege I cannot begin to describe. When the renowned essayist and novelist Mark Twain was asked to make a few remarks at a birthday similar to this one, he started off by saying something to the effect that he wouldn't like to be so heartless as to wish someone at such a ripe age eternal life. So instead of saying, long live the king, he would rather say, oh dear king, May you live as long as you wish. I too would like to say to Professor Nkondo, may you live for as long as you wish. However, taking note of the fact that he is a member of the Men's Guild in the Presbyterian Church, I may also want to add that I wish that God may keep him May God sustain Professor Nkondo. May God continue to nourish him. Because Lava Tirela Ka Yehova, Vata Tsutsuma Avanga Karali, Vata Kumama Timbama Antwa. As a small gift, I would like to sing a Shitsonga song in celebration of Professor Nkondo's birthday. Now, here's the backstory. When Professor Mushen Kondo was 11 years old, in 1951 to be precise, D.C. Marivati published one of the bravest and one of the most political songs in the country at that time. Three years after apartheid became official policy of the country, D.C. Marivati published his song titled Vakale, Vaburile, so said our ancestors. Akale Vaburile, Vaburile, Anyamuta Shivana, Bundo, Namunkati Quenrahina, Aha, Atisi Relitsi, Iwana Yami Mova, Mova. Sweet 
Samatimba le shaku Kukwana 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 Hai hai Kukwana Kukwana Hai hai Tikweni le Tikweni le